Well, we have started on a journey in the uh, in the book of Revelation, and uh, we have done a, a, a couple messages already from uh, chapter 1, and um, this morning we're going to continue that uh, that journey, and uh, my calling here as, as your interim pastor, the role of an interim pastor is to help the church prepare for their next pastor. And, 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 and I ask myself, how can I do that? How, how can I help you prepare for what your church wants to look like and be in the future? And, and what type pastor do you need to help you do that? And, and it's a time for you as a church to evaluate yourself individually and as a church and ask yourselves, what can we do to prepare our hearts and our congregation for the shepherd that we're asking God to send us? And I think there's many things you can do to prepare for that. But one of the things I think we can do is in the book of Revelation is to look at the seven letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. We can look at what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were, and, and you can ask yourself, is that us? Are, are we like that? Or what can we do to fix that? Or, or what can we do to get better at the things that are right? So two weeks ago, I've been out for two weeks, but the, the last time I was with you, we, uh, we looked in chapter 1 at verse 19. And, and I told you verse 19 of chapter 1 in Revelation was, was kind of like the key to the book. John was given instructions in that verse as to what he was to write in the book of Revelation. And, and he was told to write the things that he saw, the things that are, and the things that are to come. And what John saw was Jesus in all of his glory in chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at that this morning. In chapters 2 and 3, he wrote about the things that are. That was the seven churches. As I read to you a minute ago from verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. The book of Revelation is written to the church. If you're not saved and you're not part of the church and you read Revelation, you won't understand it because it's like reading somebody else's mail. Uh, it wasn't written to you. It was written to the seven churches. It was written to God's people. And so in chapter 1, we, we get a picture of what he saw. In chapters 2 and 3, we get a picture of the things that are the church and the church age that we're living in. And then chapters 4 through chapters 22 is prophecy, talking about things that are yet to come. And we kind of walked through that. We highlighted that the last time that I was with you. But what he saw in chapter 1 was Jesus in all of his glory. So we're going to read uh, chapter 1, the parts of that that refer to Jesus and his glory. So would you stand with me one more time and, and honor and in the reading of God's word. And I want to start reading to you Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. And it starts out and says, Behold, he is coming. And it's hard not to stop and preach right there. He's coming. Amen? All right. You are almost as loud as the kids are, but you'll get better as we go along. He's coming. Um. And, and he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. And they who pierced him, even they who pierced him, will see him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I was on that island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So here's John. He, he's imprisoned on this little island called Patmos. And it's, it's on the Lord's day. And he's worshiping in the Spirit. And he hears a voice behind him. And it sounds like a trumpet. And here's what he said in, in verse 11. And the voice speaks to him saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And those seven churches are to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see, John said, the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of those seven lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters or rushing waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. And now, verse 19 that we looked at last time. He said to John, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And then in the last verse, verse 20, he tells us what those seven stars and those seven golden lampstands are. He said, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. He said, The seven stars are the angels, or the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for John's vision. Lord, it says, when John saw you in all your glory, that he fell on his face as if he were dead. Oh, God in heaven, may we see you today not as the crucified Savior, but may we see you as the glorified Son of God. May we come to realize that the next time we see you, we will see you in all your glory. And it is your desire, Lord, that we, that we join you where you are and that we see you in your glory. Lord, give us a glimpse, just a glimpse of your glory today. And if you would do that, I believe that hearts and lives will be changed because we've been in your presence. Lord, uh, by your Spirit, and by your word, speak to the people is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You can be seated. Jesus, uh, in all of his glory. If you have your Bibles, now normally I have the verses up on the screen for you, but Maudel, of course, was getting ready this week for the, uh, for the mission trip, so... Didn't have time to, to put the verses together on the program to show them on the screen. So I hope uh, if you have your Bible with me, and that may be an electronic Bible on your phone or whatever, I hope you will follow along with me. We'll be just going through these verses that I read in chapter 1, starting with verse 7. And in verse 7, John said he's coming, and he's coming with clouds. You know, if, if you read through the Old Testament, almost every time that God showed up, he showed up in a cloud. And we call it the Shekinah glory or, 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 or the glory cloud. And, uh, and, and when Jesus ascended uh, in, in the book of Acts, it says that the cloud received him out of their sight. When, when, when Moses took the children of Israel uh, through the wilderness to the promised land, they, they, they had fire by night and a cloud by day to guide them. And that's God in that glory cloud. So he's coming, John said. And he's coming in all of his glory. And the next verse says, Every eye, <clears throat> every eye will see him. Everybody's going to see him coming. And it even says, after that, he will be seen by those who pierced him. Those very people that drove the nails into his hands and into his feet will see him coming. And, would, and then we think, well, I wouldn't want to be those guys. Really. Who put those nails in his hands and his feet? Me and you did. Did we not? It was my sin that nailed him to that cross. It was your sin that nailed him to the cross. So let's not, let's not just blame those three guys who drove the nails in his hand and his feet. But you and I were part of that. Putting him on that cross so he could pay the price and the penalty for your sin and mine. But, but every eye is going to see him. And, and, and even those guys who drove that nails are going to see him. But it, he's not going to be like he was the last time they saw him. The last time they saw him, he was naked. 
The last time they saw him, his hair was ripped and, and tattered and, and bloody with a crown of thorns buried in his, in his head. The last time they saw him, his eyes were filled with tears and, and, and swollen from the beatings that he had been through. The last time they saw him, there was this huge spike driven into his feet nailing him to that cross. The last time they saw him, Scripture said, he opened not his mouth. He didn't speak back. The last time they saw him, there was a spear that had pierced his side and out came water and blood. The last time they saw him, his face was so beaten that the Bible says you could not even recognize him as a man. That was the last time they saw him. But they're going to see him again. And the next time they see him, he's not going to look like that. And John tells us, starting with verse 9, what he's going to look like. And, and, and John said, I, I was on the island of Patmos. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He said, what you see, write in a book and send it to those seven churches. Remember, John had been given that task to write down what he saw and what an awesome assignment that was. He did his very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to describe with the, to us Jesus in all of his glory. We see Jesus now as John saw Jesus, and that's as our triumphant Lord. We get a picture of him here in all of his glory. You know, in the Gospels, Jesus is referred to as the God man. He was God, and yet he was man. He's 100% God, yet 100% man. Now, it's hard for you and I to get our arms around the God-man. But that's who Jesus was. He, he was man, and, and, and yet He was God. From the cross, one of the things, one of the seven things He said from the cross was, I am thirsty. He was the great I am, was He not? When Jesus said, I am Jesus was saying, I am God. But then he said, the great I am is thirsty. That's man. So in, in three words, he described himself as God and, and yet as man. Can, can, he, he, Moses asked the question when God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you to Pharaoh to deliver my people. And, and Moses said, who should I tell him, God, that is sending me? And he said, you tell him who? I am. You tell them the I am is sending you. So here we find in, on the cross that God man is thirsty. Well, if he's God, you know, why, why doesn't he do something about it? As, uh, as God, uh, didn't, he turn, didn't he turn jugs of water into wine? Didn't he make a wall out of the Jordan River? Didn't he make two walls out of the Red Sea? Didn't he say a few words and he calmed the wind and the rain? on the sea. The, the Scripture says He's going to turn the desert into pools and hard rocks into spring. If so, why was He thirsty? Because that was the man coming out in Him. And, 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 and He was more than thirsty when He was here in this life. He grew weary in Samaria. He was disturbed in Nazareth. He was angry in the temple. He got sleepy and tired in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and, and lay his head down and went to sleep. He was sad at the tomb of Lazarus. He was hungry in the wilderness, the God-man. He had man attributes, but he was also God at the same time. So on the cross, his body racked with pain. His mouth parched. He cried out and said, I am thirsty. And yet he said to the woman at the well, if I, the water that I give you to drink, if you drink from it, you'll what? You'll never thirst again. The God-man. In the Gospels, Jesus was the God-man. But then when we look at, at uh, the epistles, the letters to the churches, he's the head of the church. But in Revelation, we see him coming back as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We get to see Him in all of His glory. Now, seeing God in His glory, we have many examples in the Bible where people got a glimpse of God's glory. When you read about Moses over in the Old Testament, and Moses and God, they're, they're having this great conversation. And as a matter of fact, Scripture says that, that Moses talked with God face to face like a man talks to his friend. Isn't that an awesome thought? Is your conversations with God like that? 
You know, God just talked back and forth like a man talks to his friend. That's how close Moses was to God. And Moses and God are talking. And Moses has already told, or God's already told Moses, Moses, you're to lead my children out of bondage in Egypt and take them to the promised land. But God got so upset with the people, the children of Israel, because of their whining and complaining, God told Moses, Moses, you've got to take these people to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. Because if I go with you, I'll get so mad at these people that I'll kill them. So I'm going to send somebody with you. And Moses said to God, God, these are your people. Uh, God, if you're not going to go with us, then don't send us. God, if you're not going to go, don't let us leave here. And, and God said, okay, Moses, uh, I know your name, and, and, and I'm going to go with you. And Moses said, that's good, God. That's good, because if you're not, don't let us go. And then Moses said to God, God, let me see your glory. And God said, Moses, you can't see my full glory and live. But here's what I'll do. I'll place you in the rock over here, and when I pass by, after I've passed by, I'll just let you get a glimpse of my glory. And he did. And then we go over in the New Testament, and we find when, when uh, Peter, James, and John are up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and Jesus is transfigured to his glory there, and, and Peter, James, and John at first were asleep. Those guys were asleep a lot, it seems. But they, they were asleep, and, and when they come to, they, they got a glimpse. They just got a quick glimpse of Jesus and his glory. And then when Stephen is being stoned in Scripture, it said he looked up to heaven, and the heavens opened, and there was Jesus standing on the right side of the Father. And the Bible says, and he saw his glory. So we saw on the road to Damascus and Saul's conversion when he was blinded by the light. That was the glory of Jesus in his presence. And now we see his glory as John describes it to us. Our, our best picture of Jesus in all of his glory is here in Revelation uh, chapter 1 uh, as John describes what he saw. So, let me read to you again if you're following along in your Bible, verses 12 through 14. John said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, he said, I saw seven golden lampstands. And we're going to talk about in a minute what those lampstands were. And, and in the midst of the seven lampstands there was one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Now remember the last time they saw him, he was naked. His hair was ripped, torn, and tattered. He was bloody. His eyes were filled with tears and swollen. But now John describes what he looks like in all his glory. And, and he's wearing a garment and the garment goes all the way down to his feet. And around that garment, like a girdle, ar ar around the chest, there is a golden band. And his head and his hair are white and pure. White as snow, Scripture says. His eyes are like flames of fire. And he's walking among these lampstands that we'll talk about in a little bit. So if, how could we describe that garment that he's wearing? A garment that goes all the way down to his feet. Well, it would be a robe, would it not? He's wearing a robe. And who in Scripture would wear a robe? You say, well, it could be a king. King wore robes. You say, well, it could, uh, could be a priest. The priest had robes for garments. Um, it, it, it could be a judge. A judge would wear a robe, right? Judges today wear robes. So what was he? Was he king? Was he priest? Was he the judge? He was all three. Amen? He was all three. He's king. He's priest. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father today where he ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. He is my high priest. I don't have to go to a priest, an earthly priest, to confess my sins anymore. I have my priest as Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for me with his Father in heaven. So he, 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 he's, he's 
going to come back as king. He's serving right now as my priest. And one day at that great white throne of judgment, he's going to serve as judge for the unsaved. So here he is in a, in a, in a robe. A robe with gold trim. White hair that speaks to his purity and his holiness. His hair is not bloody and stringy anymore like when they put him on that cross. He's got piercing eyes. His eyes are not beaten shut. And he has x-ray vision and he can see right through you. He knows your heart. You can act and I can act on the outside like we're something special. But Jesus knows who we are on the inside. He sees right through us. The last time they saw him, that big spike was driven into his feet and held him onto the cross. But verse 15 says his feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace. So feet, feet of brass, is a symbol in Scripture that everything's under his feet, that he is control. He is in control of, of anything and everything. <coughs> and then his voice, like the sound of many rushing waters, Scripture says. Now, when the last time they saw him, Scripture said Jesus opened on his mouth. Won't be like that when he comes the next time. His voice will be the sound of many rushing waters. Ever been to a place like Niagara Falls and tried to talk to somebody over the sound of that water if you're sitting there right next to it? Avenel, on our way back from West Virginia last week, we uh, spent the night in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and found out that from the, the lady at the hotel, we were very pl close to a place called Ruby Falls. Any of you ever been to Ruby Falls in Chattanooga? Yeah, some of you have been there. Um, <clears throat> a thousand feet underground. If you're six foot five like me, don't go to Ruby Falls. <laughs> you got to walk a half mile underground and a half mile back like this. The guy that was a tour guide was about this tall. He said he had a half-inch clearance all the way through. He didn't have to bend over at all. I came out of that cave like this. But a thousand feet underground, right underneath the peak of the mountain, there was a 130-foot waterfall. And uh, because you're, you're, you're just captured there in a cave, there, there's not a, a lot of place for that sound of that waterfall to go to. And uh, you, you really can't have a conversation there underneath that fall because of the sound of the water. And this verse says when Jesus comes back, when he speaks, it's going to be like the sound of many waters or rushing waters. It's not going to be like the last time when he opened not his mouth, but uh, he's going to speak. And, and the last time they saw him, they had taken a spear and thrust it into his side under his heart. And, and, and Scripture records that blood and water mixed came out. But the next time they see him, he's got the weapon. Look at verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. The next time they see him, he's in his right hand, he's holding seven stars, and out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, and then it said his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. We, uh, we were pretty fortunate here in, in Texas. We, we, had, uh, we had a pretty good spring, stayed cool for quite a while, but it's gotten hot and it's hot. Amen? Uh, and it's here to stay. You know, summer do not even start for another week or so, right? Uh, so it's not like it's ending, it's just starting. And you know how hot it can be. Uh, I try to go out and walk in the mornings around 6.30 to 7.30 before it gets hot. But you know what it's like out there at the noonday, right? The peak of the heat uh, runs us inside. And, and, and this verse says, uh, His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. It's like being out there at 12 noon at the hottest of hottest times. Uh, that's how bright it's going to be. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus is going to be so bright, it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, it says, The city had no need of the sun of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, the Lamb in, its, in His light. So He'll be shining the next time we see Him. And, and, and now, John turns around, and this is who he sees and what he sees. And, and how does John respond to that? 
Verse 17 and 18 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am now alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades, the place of the dead, and of death. And John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Now think about this. This is John the Beloved. This is John the Disciple. This is John who walked with Jesus for three years. This is John the Beloved. This is John who at one point laid his head over on Jesus' shoulder. This was John who Jesus showed so much compassion to. This is John who stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was being crucified. And from the cross, Jesus said, John, behold your mother. Speaking of Mary, he was saying, John, I'm entrusting my earthly mother to you to care for her. John was as close or closer to Jesus than any of the other disciples. And now John sees Jesus in all of his glory. And what does he do? He falls on his face as if he were dead. It didn't say he ran up and hugged him. He didn't say he ran up and said, Oh Jesus, it's so good to see you. It said he fell on his face as if he were dead. Now let me tell you something. If John the disciple, who was that close to Jesus, when he sees the resurrected and glorified Jesus, if he doesn't run up to him and hug him, if he falls at his feet as dead, how are you and I going to respond when we see Jesus in all of his glory? I've had people tell me many times, as I would try to tell them about God and God's goodness and his willingness to send his son to die for us and, and how he wants to be involved in our lives and help us through our lives. I've had many people who are angry with God and they say, I tell you something, when I stand before God, God's going to have to, he's going to have to explain to me why he did this and why he did that. And I, God's going to be on trial and he's going he's to have to have an answer. I, mean, I want some answers from God. And I just kind of smile inside because I've read this story. And I, and I know about Job. You read about Job and, and all the trouble Job went through. And Job kept saying to his three friends, I sure would like to talk to God. I'd like to have an audience with God. I'd like for God to explain to me why he's letting this happen to me. I, I've, I, I've lived a good life. I don't have any hidden sin in my heart. His friends were telling me, Job, this must be happening because of sin in your life. And Job was saying, God's going to have to give me an answer. Well, at the end of the book of Job, God shows up. And you know what the Scripture says about Job and what he said? It said Job put his hand over his mouth and he shut up because God did the talking. So let me tell you something. When we stand before Jesus in all of His glory, don't be planning your speech. Jesus will do the talking. And you and I will listen. We'll listen because everything He says is just and true and faithful. So John who is so close to Jesus, he sees Jesus and, and he falls on his feet, on his face, as if he were dead. But Jesus, even though he's there in his glorified body, Jesus says, John, don't be afraid. And he reaches down and he touches John and, and, and with that right hand of power. And he says, get up, son. Get up, son. You don't have to be afraid. And, and even though Jesus' outward appearance had changed, he, he's now in all this majestic glory, the heart of Jesus is still the same. And he lays that right hand of power and authority on John, and, and he touches him. And it's like that Gaither song, Carl, he touched me. Do you ever feel his touch? There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. He said, he touched me. He touched me. There, is there a lot of fear in the world today? There's a lot of fear, is there not? There's fear when you're out there on a the highway traveling. There, there, there's fear uh, when, when, when you're just out and about. You never know what might happen. But, but Jesus reassures John. He touches him. And he says, John, don't be afraid. 
It's a great encouragement to you and me as a child of God. God says, fear not, don't be afraid. God said, Jesus says, you don't have to fear life because I'm the living one. He said, you don't have to fear death because I have died and now I'm alive and I've conquered death. And we don't have to fear eternity because He's got the keys. He's got the keys to Hades and He's got the keys to death. And would you agree with me that the one who has the keys is the one who has the power? And He holds the keys. He holds the keys. You and I don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of living. We don't have to be afraid of dying. And we don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen after that for eternity. So in the very beginning of this book, Jesus presents Himself to His people in all of His glory. How serious, how serious do you think Jesus is about you and I seeing Him in all of his glory. Well, let me end with this. And I'm not going to turn there and read it to you. I might read a couple verses here in a minute. But if you look in John chapter 17, Jesus prays a prayer to God the Father. And this is the night before he is taken to be crucified. And, uh, and I know we, uh, we, we, we have that model prayer in, in the book of Matthew that we call the Lord's Prayer. But if you really want to read the Lord's Prayer, read John chapter 17. In the first part of that chapter, Jesus is praying to the Father. And in the first part of the chapter, the prayer is about Jesus and His relationship to the Father. And then the middle part of that chapter, Jesus talks about He and His relationship with the disciples that were with Him on earth. But at the end of that prayer, at the end of John chapter 17, Jesus prays for you and me. Now, do you know what he prayed for for you and me? Listen to this. In John 17, 20, here's how he started. He said, I, praying to the Father, he says, I do not pray for these alone. Speaking of the disciples that have been with him on the earth, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, who is that? That's you and me. We have believed on Him because of what the disciples and, and the apostles wrote in this book. So Jesus begins to pray for those who will believe on Him through this Word. And here's what He prays for you and for me. If you're here this morning and saved, this is what Jesus has prayed for us. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom You gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which You have given me before the foundation of the world. Did you get that? Two things Jesus has prayed for, for me and for you, if you're saved this morning. Number one, His desire. He told His Father, God, my desire is that they what? That they be with me where I am. And number two, that they behold my glory which you gave me, Father, before the foundation of the world. So Jesus' prayer for you and me is that one day we join Him where He is and that we see Him as John saw Him in all of His glory. You know, we, we spend a lot of time as we should. When I was diagnosed with what the doctor said was terminal cancer, I wanted people to pray for me. But we spend a lot of time praying for sick people to be healed. But we need to know and understand that Jesus has prayed for you and me that one day we join Him where He is. And one day Jesus' prayer in my life and your life will be answered. And if you're saved, we will go to heaven into His presence, we'll be with Him forever, and we will behold His glory. Amen? We're going to see Him in all of His glory. He said basically the same thing in John chapter 14. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. He has said, we're going to join Him in heaven. And we're going to see Him. We're going to see Him in all of His glory. Now, one last thing and I'll be done. I should never tell you I'm going to be done, right? Verse 20, the last verse. Jesus helps us with a mystery. John saw Jesus with seven stars in his hand and, and, and seven lampstands. Now what does that mean? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 20, the last verse. 
He said, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, and that word angel means messenger. They are the seven messengers. That could be the seven pastors of those seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw, he said, are the seven churches. Where did John see Jesus He saw him in all of his glory, but where was Jesus when he saw him? He was walking among seven lampstands, and the lampstands represent what? Churches. He was walking among the churches. If you want to find Jesus today, and you want to get as close to his glory as you can, where can you find him? In his church. Amen? Amen. Nothing that you and I have seen will compare to seeing Jesus in his glory. Evan and I, when we left here a few Sundays ago, and, and right after church, we started on our trip to West Virginia, and, and we, we made our way uh, up, uh, up to Dallas and, 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 and then up into Oklahoma. And we had a lot of rain, a lot of thunderstorms on the way. And uh, just before dark, we were traveling north, so looking to our left, looking to the west, and, and we were driving by a, a, a large lake there in Oklahoma. And, and, and the, the sunset was just incredible. And, and it kind of just traveled with us. And the colors continued to change for maybe 30 minutes and 30 miles. And it was just ooh and awe, And just, just a time to see uh, the beauty that God has given us. And as beautiful as those things are, nothing compares. Nothing compares to the glory that we will see one day in heaven, but not in heaven so much as the glory of Jesus himself. And you know what the Bible says? You and I are going to be like him. You and I are going to go through a process called glorification. And our old body is going to be changed. And some of that glory in Jesus, we're going to have in our own bodies one day. I think what the church needs today is a new awareness of Jesus and his glory that we've read about. We need to see Jesus as Isaiah did in chapter 6 when he said, I saw him high and lifted up. I think there's a dangerous absence today of awe and reverence when we come together in church. We're, we're so concerned about how we present ourselves to, to lost people and being seeker friendly. And we're not too concerned about how we present ourselves to Jesus and all of his glory. We're, 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 we're reluctant to fall before him and to cry out to him. We need to sing that blessed old hymn more today that said, I bowed on my knees and cried holy, holy, holy. What about you? When you read the book of Revelation, is this book written to you? Are you part of his church? Or are you reading somebody else's mail? Would you like to be saved this morning? Christ said, I've got the keys to life. I can help you with your life. I've got the keys to death. I can help you overcome death. And I've got the keys to eternity. And I want you to come and be with me for all eternity. And I want you to behold my glory. You're going to see him one day. You can either meet him today and let him be your Savior and let him save you. Or you will meet him one day And he'll be your judge. And you don't want that day to ever come. You want your sins forgiven. You want to become a child of God. And I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. Meet him as your Savior today. And you won't have to worry about meeting him as judge one day. The Bible says unsaved people one day will cry for the rocks and the mountains to cover them up. So they don't have to stand before him. But you and I should be like John when he finished Revelation and he said, even so, come quickly, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for Jesus to come. I'm looking forward to that day to be with him forever and ever. I'm looking forward for him to take me out of this old body that's just wearing out. He's going to do that. Where will you be? Forgiven? Or will you be judged by him? Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to offer an invitation. An invitation is an opportunity for you to come. and I'd like to pray with you if you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior today. I'd like to pray with you if you have a need today. 
um, whatever your need may be, I'm going to stand right down front here and uh, I'm going to invite you to come. Um, greatest decision you'll ever make is to accept Christ as your Savior. Invite him into your heart and then we can look forward to his coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Revelation chapter 1. Thank you for allowing us to get a glimpse this morning of Jesus and all of his glory. How different, Lord, you're going to be when you come back as, as, as compared to what you were when you were here the first time, when you came to be our Savior, when you, when you came as a man to die on the cross in our place. Lord, we thank you that you did that. But now, Lord, we look forward to the day that you come back as King of kings and Lord of lords, that you come back as judge, that you come back as king. You will rule and rule. You'll, you will rule and reign in this old world for a thousand years and, and things will be just as you intended for it to be. But Lord, until you come back, Lord, we want to continue to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that if people will invite you into their heart, their sins can be forgiven. Lord, they can be adopted into your family. And Lord, that prayer that you prayed, that we will join you one day where you are and we will behold your glory, will be answered in the life of every believer here. Lord, by your spirit now, as only you can do, Draw people to yourself is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.